Yo! Good morning, good morning, good morning. Happy Friday, and welcome to Ask the Experts. Anything meaningful? Friday. 18 Friday. Uh, this is Jeremiah's J-Man Monero with J-Man Speaks coming to you live and direct from our global headquarters here in Rochester, New York. Let's start off with a couple things. Yes, this is Cookie Monster, okay? I know. Uh, uh, cookie, I want cookie, I want cookie. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you a quick story uh, that relates to this shirt because every time I wear it, somebody goes, is that Cookie Monster? What, is that a Cookie Monster shirt? So once upon a time, once upon a time not long ago, I was at our state meetings and I went to like a group dinner Hey, James Jock, what's up, buddy? Hey, Jeffrey Scott Stanton, good to see you guys. Um, add you guys here in a second. And so uh, I went to this group dinner, and two colleagues, we're going to call them colleagues because they're not my friends, right? Let's, let's keep it real because that's all I do. And two colleagues were like, and this is like after our meetings are done, it's dinner, and then whatever else, networking, et cetera. And they're like, are you wearing a Cookie Monster shirt? <laughs> and I was like, yeah. They were like, what are you, 12? <laughs> and it, it was in that moment that I realized, like, I don't give a shit what you think. <laughs> oh, my gosh. It was like, it was, it was just an epiphany. Um, it is very liberating when you stop caring about what other other people think and you just want to do what you do um i bought the t-shirt because i liked it and i love cookies and if you don't, you're not down with that if that's not professional enough for you that's not um you know up to your standards i love air quotes I used to have an english teacher that did air quotes every other sentence um that's okay we don't have to be friends the people that can appreciate cookie monster um, nom, 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 nom. those are my people Okay, so if you like Cookie Monster, put it, put it in the comments if you're watching live or on the replay. Uh, but today we're talking about multiple offers. We've talked about multiple offers before, uh, but keeps coming up, keeps coming up. And I think some of us are coming into a transitioning market. I'm not saying a slow market. I'm just saying, uh, and I love to quote Lawrence Yoon, uh, NAR economist, to say, we were speeding at 90 miles an hour, but now we're going like 70. So it's not that the market is slow, it's still, still fast, uh, but there are pockets where if you don't price it right and it's not in really good condition, it's gonna sit and it may not sell for full price or over and you may not have multiple offers. So you have to prepare the sellers before any of that happens, right? Because uh, some of the sellers, I would say the sellers that are listing now after a year and a half of a seller's market are like the very last ones. They've been sitting on that fence. <laughs> That's a bad uh, fence, right? But they've been sitting on that fence, waiting, 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 and hearing from everybody, seller's market, seller's market, seller's market, seller's market, seller's market, seller's market. You call them and say, we're getting multiple offers. It's crazy. I sold one down the street for 50,000 over asking, 100,000 over asking. And they're like, oh, okay, now's the time. And now that may change. So what I would do and what I like to do um, <laughs> it's none of my business what you, what you think about me. Um, I, I like that. I like that. Um, but when I first meet with the sellers and they say, well, how's the market? It's fickle. You know, it's a fickle market. What do you mean by that? Well, you know, while we still are seeing multiple offers, what I'd like to say is, you know, if, if we, we list the property at, at the perfect price and your condition is exceptional, right? And we have a great location, you know, and the sun is shining and all of the stars align and, and, and in a perfect world, we're going to sell for full price. And they go for full price. Yeah. For full price. Okay. However, maybe, maybe we get lucky. Maybe we get lucky and we have more than one person come and then two people and then three people. We have multiple offers. Maybe. Very slight, slim chance, but you never know. If that does happen, we'll be excited. See the difference in the delivery and the expectations of like, 
Oh yeah, let's list it. We'll, we'll get multiple offers, and uh, in our market and some other parts of uh, of the country, they're either doing like a, a deadline right off the bat, like when they list the property. Uh, we do what's called delayed negotiations here, and it's actually a form it's in the MLS. And if you want a copy of it, I'll send it to you. I'm not an attorney, nor will I play one on a live stream, um, but you can send it to your forms committee and see if you want to come up with something similar. But it's a delayed negotiations. To, um, and also delayed showings if if that was the case. But with the delayed negotiations, the way it works is, let's say I list a property today, great example, on a Friday. I list it today, hits the market, 9 a.m. Then I give the people, I tell them, okay, Tuesday at 6 p.m. Uh, is, is our delayed negotiations, meaning if you write an offer today, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, or Tuesday, they're all going to be reviewed at the same time on Tuesday, 6 p.m. Uh, Bank-owned properties used to do this. HUD did it from since the beginning of time, right? They call it a simultaneous period uh, just to give enough people a chance to see the property, especially in, I'd, I'd like to say, a post-COVID world, but in a COVID world because some of us are going back in, more restrictions, mass, et cetera, delta, delta, delta. We don't want to help you, help you, help you. Um, that you can't have overlap, overlapping showings. So if you have a property, you have eight to eight, you know, 30 minute showings, that's 24 showings a day in three days, that's 72 showings that, that could be done. And in some markets you're getting 100, 150 requests. So it gives an opportunity for everybody to see it, expose it to the market, and then review all offers. Uh, the challenge with that, that we're seeing right now is that when you do that at the end, you damn well better have multiple offers, right? Um, if not, then you got egg on your face and you're a big disgrace. I just keep quoting songs all day. Coffee's for closers. So that's full of coffee. Um, so why not, you know, before we had this delayed negotiation process, we should just take them as they come. First come, first serve, right? First come, first serve meant listing hits the market. New listing, let's go, we gotta go, oh, and we gotta go get it, we gotta go get it. That's the sense of urgency, that's the competition, that's the economics of it that drove the price up, right? And then if you have multiple offers that come or you have multiple people that are interested, um, then you say, hey, okay, we're gonna review all offers, highest and best offer due by this date and time. Um, I, I have noticed in some of the other towns, sellers aspirational pricing. Hold on, I like this. James Jock said, my buyers are no longer falling for sellers aspirational pricing. Even factoring recent sales, some prices are still too high. 1,000%, right? Uh, but if, if you do get offers coming in, because think of the mentality of buyers right now. If they're in the market or if they've been in the market for a while, you list a property at the top of its price range. Let's just use 300K for example. You list a property for 300K. It's probably worth 300K. However, the buyers who are looking at it have looked at umpteen other properties, they've written offers on other stuff, and they know in the history of their writing offers that nothing goes for just asking. So in their mind, they're going, man, that 300, might go for 320, might go for 350. I am not paying that, so I'm not even I'm not even writing an offer. Right? Sometimes you get feedback like, oh, it's great, really nice property, but they don't want to pay 350 for it. Well, they're not. It's 299 9 man. What are you talking about? No, no, uh, we can't. And so when pricing the properties, James James brings up a, a, a good because looking at the comps doesn't work. If you look at the comps right now for what's closed, that means in, in, our, in our market and other markets, it's what went into contract 60, 90, 180 days ago, depending on how long your closings take. That is not an accurate depiction of what the market is doing right now, right? What I like to do is, is look at the active properties and then I like to look at the pending properties. And then I will pick up the phone. Remember that thing? You pick up the phone, contact those... Uh, the, the ones that are pending, and I might say, hey, James, you know, James, I know him. I'm like, hey, James, I uh, saw that property that you sold on Champlain Street. Uh, 
if you don't mind me sharing with me, you don't have to tell me the exact price, but maybe give me a percentage. Was it like 10% over asking? Was it asking? Was it below? Uh, just so I can get an idea. We're pricing a property right around the corner. Uh, we want it, want to be priced, priced right. And I have found 99 times out of 100, agents will let me know, right? Uh, it's, it's, it's very much a collaborative effort out there in our market, maybe your market's a little bit different if you're watching this and you're like, no, we stab each other and we don't we don't like to play nice. But for the most part, I've heard so many people um, playing nice in the sandbox, calling me and going, hey, Jay, what did that sell for? And I mean, I'm in contract, I would, might say, hey, 20% over asking, to be honest. Um, and the reason, I might give them the reasoning behind it. We had one uh, that went, uh, let me see, what's this version? It went, 90,000 over asking and it was because there was nothing else somebody could buy it was a property with acreage so when you look at it you're gonna go what in the hell without knowing the acreage or looking at the acreage side of it you're wondering how did this property sell for 90,000 over asking and it was it was a bidding war we had you know umpteen offers but it was because there was nothing else you could buy with 47 acres uh, anywhere in that county and the, and the surrounding areas for under, I think this, this property was like one eighty nine nine. I might have priced it with a log cabin, not just not just the the land. So, um, Leticia says, so true. Comps definitely don't help what the market is doing right now. And so, having that conversation with the sellers, and then and then telling them how will we handle offers when they come in, right? Because it's they're, they're looking to you as the expert. And I can tell you how you handle those multiple offers can mean the difference between a full ask and a multiple offer over asking. Even if it's just two. Okay, I had one in the in the past week. There was, th uh, sorry, four offers on that property. And it started out with one that was at full ask. And he would have been okay with it, but I said, okay, let's let's see what we can do. Okay, so let's say an offer comes in. I'm going to switch over to... The whiteboard if you guys got questions put them in the comments um yeah leticia you could call me anytime leticia anytime uh let's see here i'm gonna come over to the whiteboard there we go oh whoa camera number two hey folks okay so i have a couple properties well, i have one property set up here um, and I'm going to explain the scenario of what happened. Uh, so we have this property listed. It's on the market for roughly seven days. Uh, I tell the seller that, you know, just what I told you. Hey, maybe if the stars align, da, 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 we might get a full, full price offer. We get a full price offer. Let's be happy because we're literally, that's what we're asking. Um, and, and you got to have the conversation and say, you know, it's not our starting price. Nowhere in the MLS does it say this property is starting at unless you're an auctioneer and that's different. Okay. It's a list price. So you got to tell sellers we're offering something for sale. We're selling this marker for a dollar. If somebody offers us a dollar, we sell it. That's the way it works. You don't go, well, I know you wanted it for a dollar, but we're going to counter for a dollar 10 just because we heard the market was hot. Ultimately a property is worth what somebody's willing to pay. Right? So you come in here. This property is on the market. Um, list price, this is imaginary, okay? List price was 305. First offer comes in with no competition for 305, okay? Um, with a conventional mortgage and they're gonna do an inspection. Why wouldn't they? Because there's no other competition. But they did come in with a strong offer at, at full ask. And I think they had, um, they had something else in here about not showing during the inspection period or during the inspection or attorney approval. Okay, and this was a property to the east of me, uh, which our markets start to change over to like Syracuse area. I'm in Rochester, Syracuse is right next to us. And they do things a little differently. So let's talk about that first. Now, if we don't show the property during the during the in our in our market, we have attorney approvals. So it goes into contract, and we need an attorney to approve that contract before it's 
it's ratified, right? But then we still have an inspection to go through. Now, we countered this to begin with, that we're not going to do that. I work for the seller, okay? I understand that he doesn't want us to show it because he doesn't want another offer to come in, outbid him, get his deal canceled. So to make everybody happy, what I said was here, what we'll give you is first right of, you guys see that? Yeah, refusal. So what that means is, we're gonna call the guy John. John, uh, if another offer comes in, like we're still gonna show it, we have to, because what if something happens in the inspection? What if your, your buyer gets cold feet? We have to do what's in the best interest of the, I have to do what's in the best interest of the seller. The seller has to do what's in their best interest. And so we'll say, but I'll give you a first right of refusal. That means if another offer comes in, I will let you know that another offer came in, give you an opportunity to modify your offer and meet or beat it. Does that sound fair? Yes, okay. So the other thing is, in this market, not my market, this tri this market that's in between us, um, they don't have a deadline on their offers. Nowhere on their contract does it say, offer good until. That's a problem for me. So if your contract doesn't have offer good until, I'm going to add that there. And so we sent that to him and said, okay, our offer's good until tomorrow at 6 p.m., Eastern Standard Time, because you don't know I'm in, on the East Coast, but you don't know where his client is, and I just don't want to have any issues. I always put the, the time zone in there. It shows that I'm, I'm internationally known, but I'm known to rock the microphone. Okay, so that's, we put the deadline. Now, the next day, we didn't good until 6 p.m. I think we also countered out that they would waive the inspection. So he then counters our offer. We made it good until 6 p.m. the next day. He counters, and when... A buyer's agent counters an offer. The first offer is done. Our counter offer to them is done. Okay? So once you counter it, it's done, and we're free to do whatever we want. He counters it. In the midst of him countering something for just the inspection, I told him he could do the inspection. We just didn't want it as a contingency. Now, second offer comes in. Second offer comes in at 305. However... They have an escalation clause that they'll go 1,000 over the highest offer up to 318, okay? Now, currently my highest offer is 305, so that makes this one 306. Whoopee! Another $1,000 really doesn't mean much uh, to us in the, in the grand scheme of things. So for me, it's going to come down to they also were conventional financing. They also wanted to do an inspection. I then go back to the first guy, and I say, first guy, I offered you first right of refusal. An offer has come in. What do you want to do? We'll give you till tomorrow to decide uh, before we respond to this offer. He then comes back the next day and says, we're going to keep our offer as written. I'm like, son of a gun. I was hoping he would go over because if he, let's say if he went up to 310, then that makes this one 311, right? Then I've just made another six grand for myself. Much better scenario. In the midst of this happening, third offer comes in. For 310. Dun, dun, dun. Okay. Comes in at 310. Um, this is on a Saturday. So then I, I call everybody. And I also, um, if you have showing time in your market, showing time has a, uh, a message all agents feature where you can put in the subject line, you know, offers received part of our uh, showing feedback request says, would you like to know when an offer comes in? And so, we send it to everybody, say, hey, offers come in on this property. Um, we need your highest and best. Highest and best. Because highest doesn't always mean best. Um, by Sunday at 6. Because we had three more showings the next day. Okay. So they all say, all right, we're going to keep it the same, keep it the same, keep it the same. This one has a 2K over. A 326 cap. I got a lot of numbers here, but hopefully you're staying with me. This makes, since this one is 305 and it goes to 318, that makes this offer 320, makes that offer 318. It caps that offer right out, makes that offer 320, even though their cap is 326. Okay, now here's a little wrinkle. Because in real estate, there's always wrinkles. It can't be so smooth. 
Um, fourth offer comes in after the 6 p.m. It comes in at 9 p.m. Sunday because he's a type of agent that says, oh, I don't care about deadlines. Whatever, man. He comes in, and his offer sucks, to be honest. Comes in, it's like 255 with an escalation clause up to 305. Okay? Rather than telling that agent, don't bother, right? He, tell, he calls me at 9 p.m. and says, I'm going to write an offer. Okay, send it to me. You have a duty as a seller's agent to present all offers. It's in the Code of Ethics. I'll show you that in a second. Okay? Um, but I forward it to the seller. I have the seller respond in writing via email saying we've decided to go with another offer at this time. Thank you for your consideration. Okay? Now, for this guy. We then make a phone call to, to number three over here because they are seemably be, seem to be the winner. There's one other thing to talk about, um, and I need another whiteboard. I don't want to erase all this, but appraisal gap coverage, okay? So I call this agent. I go, well, if, if you want to, you know, we're going to counter you for 320, counter you for 320. We're not e exercising the escalation clause. Um, because I don't want to get into like sending them the whole offer, redacting it, and them saying, well, th you know, theirs is conventional with like five. Per you just, I don't want to get into that. Okay, their cap is 326. We're being fair and reasonable by saying for 320, you can have it, no inspection, uh, but we'd like for you to cover any appraisal gap, meaning the difference between the price that you're willing to pay and what it appraises. Now, I don't see it being an issue, being that we only went over. $15,000 only in this market. But I want to be sure this buyer has 20% down, conventional financing. They could always go conventional 5% if they needed to pay the difference and, and still be okay. But I need that in writing from the, from the agent. She goes, let me triple check, calls the buyer. She says, yes. We put it in writing in a counter offer. They sign off. We go into contract. Okay? This person, I call them and I let them know, hey, uh, you were you were second. Uh, the seller decided to go. It was very close. The seller decided to go with another offer. Uh, price, terms, and conditions were all consideration. I try to give them a little bit of feedback without giving them everything about the offer. And then I would say, um, is it okay if we keep your offer as a backup? And I'm only saying for like the next seven days because we're contingent on attorney approval. There's no inspection. But just in case the buyer gets cold feet, is it okay that we keep yours as a backup? Agent says, yes, absolutely. We're going to continue looking. If we want to rescind that, we'll let you know. Okay, but they like the house enough. They're second place. Good hero always has a backup plan. All right? So we do the 318. Tell them that's the backup. And this poor guy who came first to the table is out in the wind. Okay? He didn't get anything. He didn't get accepted. Uh, however, if you're first to the table, you need to come in strong. Like, I, I might have done a maybe do a full full ask or maybe even a little bit over and then have a, a an escalation clause because that will keep the competition from coming because somebody might call and say, hey, do you have an offer on that property? Yes, we do. Uh, and it has an escalation clause. Okay. So let me come back over here, see if you guys have any questions. I wasn't really looking. Uh, boom, boom, boom. Okay. I see what you're saying. Do, 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 do. Coming back. Okay. So James says FHA, VA, and USDA don't allow appraisal gaps. Okay. Um, well, then they need to change the conventional if there's an appraisal issue. Uh, or maybe they're not in, even in, in consideration in a multiple offer situation. Uh, but, yeah, my pleasure. Uh, so let me go to the – I'm going to show you the code of ethics because some of you may not be – well, all of you are familiar with it if you're watching and you're my friend. Uh, but there's a couple things on here that I want to share with you. First of all, on page one, I'm going to move myself over here. Ba -doo, ba -doo. And if you're not familiar with this, you can get it online. Um, if you send me the message COE, I think I should auto reply with a copy of this. Um, but let me zoom this a little bit. Okay, so 1-3. See that? I have that highlighted. I bring that with me on listing appointments, and I say, 
Mr. and Mrs. Seller, in, attempt, in attempting to secure a listing, realtors shall not deliberately mislead the owner as to market value. What that means is, I cannot come in here with a recommended list price. You then tell me a price that's considerably different or higher, and then I proceed to list that house. That would be a violation of the code of ethics. And I'm an ethical realtor. I would never do that. Okay? However, somebody coming in after me, they may come in and say, oh, I'll list it at whatever price because the market's crazy. Uh, you know, I'm giving you all the data. Uh, it is an educated guess. The market will ultimately dictate price. But I, I'd rather turn you down now than let you down later. That's one of my favorite lines. I'd rather turn you down now than let you down later. There's other agents who may want to take the listing in the hopes that they could reduce the price later on. I want to do it the best I can right from the very beginning. Okay, that's 1-3. The other part of this, let me move myself to the other side. <laughs> one seven. One seven and one eight. One six and one seven one eight. Um, one six. Realtors shall submit offers and counter offers objectively and as quickly as possible. They don't have a timeline in there, but as quickly as possible in my mind would be within twenty four hours. That's still why I would put a, a, a deadline on there. Um, you know, in the buyers market days, we could go in there and say we could present an offer in person and give them an hour to decide, right? If you're presenting a person, sometimes 15 minutes. Say, we'll go outside, you guys talk about it, um, you can accept it, you can counter and not respond. We'll put a deadline and submit your offers as soon as possible. Don't drag it out, don't say you can't, like the fact that you can't reach a seller in this day and age is a lie. There's no way you can't reach a seller unless you're in a total, James maybe, right? You're in the North Country, they're in a totally remote location, maybe you need to get like a can uh, with a string on it, to talk to them, that would be different, right? <laughs> Hello, seller. Yeah, that might be different, but still within 24 hours, you should be able to, and you should be able to have those lines of communication already set up because the, the listing's on the market. You have to. Um, you don't want to lose a potential sale because of that. Number 1-7, uh, when acting as listing brokers, realtors shall continue to submit to the seller, landlord, all offers and counter offers until closing until closing, until closing. You see that? That that That's what you gotta realize, okay? Um, unless the seller or landlord has waived this obligation in writing. Too often, nobody who's watching this now, I'm sure, but agents go, oh, well, we accepted an offer, don't even bother. That is not your decision to make. Your decision is to say, just like I told the guy who, you know, after the deadline goes, I'm gonna write an offer. Okay, well, there's a dollar to full asking price. I'll present your offer in a professional, courteous manner. Send it on over. Okay, I, I know of an instance where somebody submitted an offer uh, two weeks before closing, 100000 over asking. And, and that seller decided to cancel the contract that they were in and take the offer for $100,000 more. You say, well, he, he would have got sued. With $100,000, you can hire an attorney and you can tell the buyer to take, you know, kick rocks, here's 20 G's, okay? And the buyer might be a little bit ticked off, but hey, $20,000 consolation prize, they'll take a walk, trust me. Um, so it says here, upon the written request of a cooperating broker submits an offer to the listing broker, the listing broker shall provide, as soon as practical, a written affirmation to the cooperating broker stating that the offer has been submitted to the seller landlord or written notification that the seller landlord has waived the application to have it offer presented. Um, so some of the markets, I know our market does, Downstate does, they have a um, confirmation of offer presentation form that the seller uh, is should sign if the buyer's agent asks for it. It's where there's a lack of trust and they go, did my offer even get presented? Huh, did it? And so that's why like, I, I would prefer to even, even if the buyer's agent doesn't ask, like and, and just trying to be transparent and rise above it and be better, be the better, better person, have the seller do it in writing via email. That's fine. I don't, don't necessarily have to sign a form for each offer. I mean, you have 15, 20 offers on a property uh, that, that can get a little crazy, but just reply back via email, forward it to the agent with a little bit of feedback. Um, like the fourth guy, the seller decided to go with another offer. Price, terms, and conditions were all a consideration. Actually, the price was considerably 
higher than yours just to give them an idea like dude you know there's three offers on a property and you come in under asking to me that doesn't seem like a uh, a, a very well-informed buyer's agent okay and um let's see let me sc scroll this down a little bit more Okay, 1-8, realtors as agents or brokers of buyer's tenants shall submit to buyer's tenants all offers and counter offers until acceptance, but have no obligation to continue to show properties to their clients after an offer has been accepted unless otherwise agreed in writing, right? So that means you have a buyer's like, hey, I know our offer is accepted, but who knows? I want to keep looking at houses. You don't have to do that, okay? Um, and, and then it says, um, if they find something else, Obtain the advice of legal counsel if there's a question as to whether a pre-existing contract has been terminated. Uh, there's instances where something something may fall apart. That first offer falls apart. You bring it, get a second offer that comes in. You have to make that second offer contingent on uh, release of the first one. I'm not an attorney, nor where I play one on live stream, but that's what legal counsel will tell you. Okay, so that's code of ethics. Brush up on that. The other one you may have seen. You guys may have seen this before, but this is the uh, this is my offer template. If you have multiple offers representing a seller, oh, this makes it so easy. We don't, you don't have to review, right? In this example, 12 offers. I'm not reviewing 12 offers individually, line by line. I forward them all. They reply that they received it. All of that, like I already discussed. But then here, we just go over. Um, we don't have the buyer's name in there. And actually, the our updated form has just the, the, uh, the buyer's agent's name that's how we classify each offer because from a fair housing standpoint i don't want it to say you know perez that's one of my i have five names by the way jeremias agenda roki perez manero um but somebody may go oh mr perez well, we don't want perez is here and we're discriminating right so i'm not going to give them the opportunity to do any of that uh the name is blank could they see it on the offers yes but i'm not going to have it on this on this uh template that i'm using then we actually color code it gold, silver, and bronze. Because <laughs> gold is first place. There was a tie for, or no, silver um, there was by themselves, and then there was a tie for third uh, for this particular property. Um, and that's it. Oh, the, the third thing, because this is all about representing sellers, is creating an email address just for offers. Okay. Um, and then I'll, I'll get to, to buyer's letters, James, because that's a hot topic as well. Um, but creating an email address, my biggest fear in representing sellers in a multiple offer situation is that I miss one. Uh, my email is a lot like yours. I mean, it's cluttered. I get hundreds of emails a day. And what if the agent doesn't put the property in the subject line? or he doesn't put offer in the subject line, or, or somehow I miss it because the agent doesn't call me or text me because that happens. They just send an offer because they've written so many offers and they're so jaded and worn out. They're like, yeah, and they send another offer. I won't get it anyways, right? I don't want to miss something. So in your private remarks, just say, hey, send all offers to um, jamesjockoffers at gmail.com, right? Simple, greatest. Then you know when that email address has an email, you're like, bing, money, bing, go like this. <laughs> money, that's right, we got some money in there. Wait, wait, where's the one I, I did one the other day that I really liked? Oh, an offer comes in. Okay, I can't find the one I'm looking for, but I'm easily sidetracked. Just a strict email address for the offers uh, is a good. Oh, yeah. And so uh, James said he, he saw the buyer letters on my on my template. Yeah, we're, we're putting in whether they had a buyer's letter or not. We're not forwarding that to the seller. We're letting the agents know that we're not forwarding them to the sellers. But again, every state is different. <laughs> Every local board is different. Uh, there's recommendations. And then I know Oregon just made it illegal to send a buyer's letter. Because um, in, in, in some areas, it's a recommendation or a best practice, which means we recommend you don't do it. If you do it, 
Are you going to real estate jail? No. However, it does give uh, the whole the whole reasoning behind it is it gives the opportunity for the seller to discriminate on so many protected classes. Okay. Um, if you were able to write a, a buyer's letter that had nothing, no protected classes in it, then I guess you could present it, but then the, the listing agent would have to present it. We have buyers that are going by houses, not our buyers, but we've had uh, <laughs> we've had times where the buyers drive by the houses and drop off a letter, drop off flowers, I mean, t all kinds of stuff uh, to get their offers accepted. And, Buyers and sellers can talk. We can't always control that. We recommend that they don't. Um, but it's crazy, right? And it's it's important now in this market because if you're not you're not seeing the balance start to happen, it's coming. And I'm not saying the sky is falling, but you should get ahead of this and start having these conversations with your sellers. Hey, if you tell them in a perfect world, if the stars align and everything is great and we're standing on one foot and the sun is shining, then we should get multiple offers. And you do, you're a hero, right? That's called exceeding expectations. But if you, why is this zoomed in? So let me back this up. Sorry. Yeah, there we go. Um, but if you, if you tell them we're definitely gonna get multiple offers, we're out, this market's crazy. Oh, it's amazing, 100 over, blah, 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 and then you get something at full asking, they're going to be pissed at you. And they're going to go, well, it's your fault that our house only sold for a full price. Like, what? Are you serious? Okay, so manage expectations, and you will get it done. Do we have any other questions? Just put it in the comments. I like to keep these to around 30 minutes. Next week, we will talk about client appreciation parties because uh, I had a survey online. If you don't follow me on the Instagram, follow me there. Um, that's where I, I post a lot of questions. Like, I don't ever always know what to talk about. But we're going to talk about client appreciation parties. Now is a great time as we open or close back up again. <laughs> uh, we'll talk about different things that you can do uh, to show your clients that you appreciate them and get your, uh, get your vendors and affiliates involved. And really, I mean, now, man, if you could do something by the end of August or in September, depending on when your school starts in your area, this is the time you haven't seen them in so long and people are dying to see other people you can do something outside. I'm going to give you a lot of ideas next week, but tune in next week. Um, and then we're, we also have a great podcast that we've launched uh, with Jeffrey Scott Stanton. Um, it's called J man's J man's and J man and Jeffrey's much to say about nothing podcast. That's Tuesdays uh, at 1230. Uh, we have a whole bunch of alliteration with J's, but I can't remember it's, jaunty jovial something jubilee <laughs> so anybody real estate mortgage people professionals it doesn't matter we could talk about anything uh over there but this is jeremiah J. man monero let me put on my favorite superhero music let's see right here <laughs>